All right. Good morning. Keep eating. I keep yawning, whatever. Um, now I, I know the effects of coffee uh, after breakfast, so I might leave for a few minutes and come back. Uh, it's not fair with the lights up. I just thought I'd throw this up here. Uh, uh, one guy, one wise guy here in the front row said uh, he's being underpaid according to that. Uh, but none of us believe that. I'm not ready to start yet. This is just my preliminary. I just uh, thought that those trail riders that were with me yesterday might enjoy this one. Um, and there's a story there about the uh, saddle. And I would ask Cecil Couch if he would uh, explain where the saddle came from. Cecil? Uh, Mary Lou is in the room, so uh, leave out the, uh, the description of the salesperson. <laughs> yeah, she can hear you. Go ahead, Cece. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> we were at, George and I were at a uh, Southwest pastor meeting down in uh, lovely Arlington, Texas once, and a, uh, a good friend of all of ours by the name of Dick Field rainy day and George said hey I gotta go buy some boots or something you guys go with us and we ended up in Fort Worth at some cowboy store Ryan's Ryan saddle shop <coughs> and uh, the young uh, person <laughs> this is where it gets tricky <laughs> on us, uh, who had been born in Ohio because her legs formed a perfect O <laughs> <laughs> no, no I she, uh, she was a true cowgirl that came up and had a belt buckle the size of a Plymouth hubcap. And, uh, <laughs> Dick Field and I were about the same size, and we said, Dick, that guy's butt is about as big as our thigh. <laughs> and George went off to do something, and uh, we looked around, and when he came out of the store, he said he bought a $12,000 saddle. <laughs> but I want to thank Cecil for that saddle. That's the $12,000 saddle. And the, and the uh, UPS was on strike at that time, and I forgot that I bought it. So about... Two months later, this box arrives, and Mary says, there's a big box here. I said, geez, I don't know what it is. I got home, and here's this saddle that I had forgotten about. She said, what are you going to do with it? The saddle is so heavy now, I can't even lift it. I can't even use it. But I want to thank Cecil for that. <laughs> We're not ready to start yet. Now, uh, you've all been watching TV, and so uh, this is a picture of my son and myself. And I don't know who that guy is in the middle. <laughs> Hayes, that's uh, for you there on the bottom. That's, that's where my money goes, is the uh, Ohio Republicans. Uh. <laughs> that's Kemp. And K is there anybody that didn't know who that was? Kemp who? Kemp who? And I got that for nothing, too. It was, uh, it was out in Vail at a symposium. And, uh, I got that on my own little camera, and I didn't have to give a big donation for it. But now you're not going to get that probably for less than 5000 bucks. All right, now I'm ready to start. My name is George Wasner. I'm from uh, Lake Erie Screw in Cleveland. Our family's been in the fastener business for 110 years, and I think that's about enough. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, the reason we're out of the... Uh, there's not going to be any kids left in the fashion industries because my father had 25 uh, grandchildren and each one of them uh, got married so that's 50 and then you know the uh, number is about half of them are going to get divorced so now we're up to about 100 kids to try to get into the business and uh, Moses and Stanley here I, I, I like the fact that you got your kids in but when that thing starts going down the line there there's, there's going to be an awful lot of kids there and uh, that's when you yeah when you get up to 110, call me. But anyways, Charlie started Lampson Sessions in uh, 1886. And one of the things that happened is uh, uh, old uh, George Case, uh, way back there, and, and uh, Mr. Sessions went out for lunch. And they came back, and they said, well, Charlie, how did things go? And he said, well, everything went pretty good, except that uh, that box over there on the wall kept ringing. And I didn't know what to do with it about. And that was, that was the telephone. So my grandfather didn't even know what a telephone was when he started work. And then he started uh, Cleveland Rod Products in 1908, and it's called United Screw and Bolt, and they're still in business in, in Cleveland. <clears throat> in 28, my dad had worked for uh, Charlie and my uncle and, uh, over at Cleveland Rod, and uh, in those days, 
Every time my dad would have an idea or a suggestion, Uncle Carl would say, mind your own goddamn business, we don't need your advice. And so that was his decision. And I'm not being profane. I'm not being profane, but that's just the way they talked. So John said, the hell of that, I'm not taking that crap from Uncle Carl. I'm going to start my own business. So he bought a couple old waterberries and started there in Lakewood, Ohio. In 1946, he sold out to three of the uh, people that, he, uh, that worked for him, and they call it True Fit Screw Products, and they're now in Medina, Ohio, and they're still in business. And he started the uh, Lake Erie. Uh, in 1986, we sold Lake Erie Screw to Brian Campbell of Campbell Industries. <coughs> And a couple years later, he changed it to TriMask because the Masco people uh, sold some companies over to him. He had worked for Masco. And so the company now is uh, a division of the Masco Corporation. Um, we also have SK Screw and Monogram Aerospace into our fastener group. We, in 1993, uh, we started another company in Frankfurt, Indiana, another plant, a uh, world-class plant. Um, it is, Cecil. So. <laughs> we didn't go to St. Joe. We went to the other side of the state. Um, and that plan's coming along real nice. And uh, this year, 1996, I took on the role of chairman. I didn't retire. Bobby, as, as you uh, indicated, that I, maybe I slowed down a little bit, but didn't retire. And Jerry Begg, who was with uh, Timken out of Canton, has taken over as president of the company, representing the first non-family uh, leadership in, in 50 years. And this year also we celebrate our 50th anniversary. What I've done, I've got kind of a combination of things, is I went through some old notes that I had. And uh, in 1975, we went into the uh, NFDA in Las Vegas. That was our first meeting. And that was interesting because I went with Don Hoke, a salesman that works for us. And somehow our rooms got mixed up. And uh, Mary Lou called, and uh, she got Don, and where's George? And it was one of those things that that happens uh, in Las, only in Las Vegas. But there were some interesting tidbits that I picked up uh, during the meeting. These are some of my notes. Cleveland Cap is looking for a 10% increase in productivity over 1974. The market in Japan is burned out. This is 1974. In a poll taken by raising of hands to ask whether the group thought it would be one, two, three, four, or six months before people would start to buy again, the average was three months, with some being one month and a few at six. Cleveland Cap is looking to December before the market returns. They were looking at eight months, so they're still around, I believe, aren't they? Is Cleveland Cap uh, still in business? That the, uh, we went to the Hershey meeting in, in Hershey, PA. This is in 1975. We took a trip to uh, Bethlehem Steel. Uh, the buses were 45 minutes late, which is normal. Uh, we thought we were going to see a modern and up-to-date, uh, but actually it was a 1918 style plant. Uh, this plant had never been inspected by OSHA. That's when OSHA was popular. I think that's why they closed that plant down once they found out about it. There was no guards over the machines. They had the belt-driven things up from the ceiling. The floors were slippery. We almost slipped three times. You would have been better off with ice skates. Uh, floor dry all over the place, garbage and junk everywhere. Their warehouse did look fairly decent. Uh, they had the racks going up about 14 high, and they had an automatic system. After seeing their operation, I can understand why people insist on final inspection. I think that's what caused the government to get involved in our business right there. Because there are bins all over the place with sloppy tags and some with no tags whatsoever. Um, there must be a problem with the customers getting what he orders. This is the first time I met uh, Mel Kirshner. And everybody said, this guy is a real character. And uh, he, he got on me pretty good. But uh, after that, I, somebody said, don't pay attention to him. He's always like that. Is that true? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, my next note is Allied International. The president of Allied International, Eric Cohen, that was the first time I had met Eric, had quite a bit to say about the import industry. He doesn't j feel Japan is going to be a main factor in the future. And what the American manufacturing is doing is all right, but it is only a temporary stop. He does not feel that Japan is still going to bomb the market in the next few years because they are running into higher wages, pollution, and other problems they will not be able to, and they will not be able to sell in this market. Again, this is 1975. Uh, he feels that they were increasing their prices and that that will no longer be a problem. If they increase their prices, I never saw it. The problems will be the fast when we come in from other locations, such as India and South America. And this is what Eric was projecting now, and he's still projecting that, by the way. 